you all for coming. I'm delighted to uh, get the chance to have spoken with some of you before, and, uh, and I'll stay around afterwards in hope of meeting you more, more of you even. And um, uh, I do speak this evening as, a, as an independent scholar. Um, I've been in and out of government over time, but I'm on leave and I'm just speaking for myself, and, and uh, the DOD wouldn't recognize uh, my views as, as, as a PAO ready, so don't worry about uh, anything official. I'm uh, unofficial uh, and an independent scholar. Uh, I've been in terrorism for uh, a number of decades, actually, and I'm interested still today in uh, learning more. And, um, and uh, I, one reason I love, I love teaching at the graduate level is because in places like IWP, where I served very happily for years, um, I'm always learning all the time. Um, our subject is, is a fascinating. <coughs> it, 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 terrorism is about power. Uh, but it's also a perverse form of communication, and uh, so, in a way, uh, both uh, power and communication are involved in the evening's discussion. To succeed, uh, terrorists have to, in their own crude way, uh, make an effect in politics. Uh, they have to forcefully place their ideas and their goals in front of multiple audiences, external, internal, foreign, um, and uh, without uh, this kind of argument, uh, then their actions are bare or empty. Uh, it's like a banging a gong, uh, but without anyone knowing what the summons is for. So terrorists make arguments. Uh, the man, uh, Abdel Hamid Abaoud, who turned up in Paris in uh, late 2015 to conduct that assault, which took, I think, a hundred lives or so, <clears throat> Didn't, didn't just come uh, and didn't just shoot, <coughs> didn't just make mayhem. Uh, he made arguments. He appeared uh, in the north of Europe, then he went back to Syria, gave a long interview in Dabiq magazine about why he was doing what he's doing and how he was going to go back to Europe. And then he did. He did go back to Europe and he wasn't caught on the way. And when he died, his life was not, had not been wasted. It was a meaningful uh, act of terrorism and participation in the ISIS campaign had deep meaning for him and for others. And so the argument matters, not just the act. So there's astounding variety in my subject. What can I possibly do in sort of 40 minutes uh, to get at it? Here's how I intend to organize. I hope it satisfies you, and if it doesn't, then tell me later, and we'll, we'll take some turns and then look at what you want to look at. I'm going to try to touch on seven types of communication by terror groups. In each case, I'll make comments about a man or a group, uh, and then uh, after that, I'll talk about a particular form of media that that, that, that terror group is good at, and then I'll say a bit about its influence beyond that personal, that, that present case. So we'll say just a word or two about things like radio, the newspaper, uh, speech making, television, the book, the internet magazine, and uh, the advertisement. There is a wonderful chapter in this book on social media. I'm not talking about it. Uh, my colleague, Randy Bodish, wrote it. And it's really good. And Randy knows ISIS cold. And uh, he knows ISIS social media. And he knows computers. And um, he's way ahead of me. So you'll enjoy the chapter. But I'm not going to do social media. And it's also true, if you think about it, honestly, you know a lot about that already. Many of you are experts on social media in one way or another. And so I'm going to do some things maybe you're not quite so expert on. And I'm going to start with this, radio. This uh, brilliant fellow, uh, I've read all his books. Uh, this is a terrific brain. Franz Fanon used to be very well known. He's not so much anymore. He was a symbol of the Algerian resistance called the National Liberation Front, but he was not Algerian. He was from Martinique. The FLN was not the usual kind of Salafist radical movement you might think of today. The FLN was nationalist and it was socialist. And um, when you wanted, as a very religious warrior, 
or a very communist person you wanted into their organization, you could get in, but only by accepting their program. So they had an eight-point program. They created it and published it in November of 54, and they fought according to it until 62 when they won. And it was an amazing insurgency. Imagine defeating in the post-war world when France has, is on the Security Council of the UN and a, bu a burgeoning nuclear power and an influence in North Africa and had been there for years and years and decades and more years. <coughs> and the Algerians beat him. And one reason he beat him was because of smart guys like this man, a trained a psychoanalyst from a French school, a Dr. Franz Fanon. So they had a kind of international flair in, in their propaganda that was very important. Oxford did a tremendous study on on the FLN's Foreign Overseas Diplomacy in 02, published by a guy named Connolly. I recommend it. It's called The Diplomatic Revolution. It's about this thing. Mm -hmm. These guys were not just guerrillas. They were thinking all the time. And they had newspaper, and they had guys speaking abroad in semi-official capacities. Fanon was a diplomat for a while. They had all kinds of media. Well, they had radio as well. And while their newspaper, El Mujahid, is more famous, they had an important radio station. Fanon wrote a priceless essay all about it, and everyone's forgotten it. So I've tried to kind of revive it in my chapter of the book. Uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting uh, thing because uh, the, the so-called voice of fighting Algeria, the voice of free Algeria, was based on the notion that the French had used radio in a classically French and, and therefore, in their case, imperialist way to, per, to make their culture pervasive in the north of Africa. And these guys were determined to flip that around, and they could with the technology that they had, because the war starts at the very time, a little thing called the transistor radio, it's making its way into the world. And they were able, with mobile transmitters and transmission abroad in, 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 in close uh, neighboring countries like Morocco or Egypt, to get uh, support by radio. So they're one of the first fighting groups to found, uh, to found radio, and they did really well with it. Now, um, he uh, personally wrote a lot for the newspaper and sometimes for the radio, but he never personally broadcast. But because he was a brilliant guy and because he was really indignant about French colonialism and all, he was very important to the movement. Now in this slide we have another option. The classic kind of moderate nationalist, not necessarily a socialist, certainly uh, not a communist, certainly not an intensely religious person. Perhat Abbas was another face of the rebellion and an important one, but he is somewhat marginalized in this movement because he'll be <coughs> displaced by folks who are far more willing to be violent. That is, terrorism is a strategic choice, as Martha Crenshaw and others have shown us over time. It's a calculated thing, and so it isn't just about argument. And in this case, uh, this was a very gifted uh, politician who was useful to the movement, uh, but he was a moderate nationalist, and so uh, he's not uh, a focus of the book in the way that the FLN was. Uh, the FLN made a strategic choice uh, and use terrorism, and we can prove that in documents that, uh, that they have, and a few excerpts of which I, I published in a book with Cambridge in 2006, in the spring, when I was doing a lot on how terror groups end. That was one of my publications of those early years. Uh, but in fact, this is not the, the important fellow, but the other Fanon is the one more important. Now, radio is a, is a legacy then for other groups. And so when you're in ISIS, just because you're great at social media or you know satellite TV or something else, it doesn't mean you don't know radio or you don't care about radio. And this is an early indication of one of the themes of the book, which is that just because somebody's terrific at a particular kind of communication does not mean they abandon the older ones they already have. Just because there's something new and high-tech and sexy like television doesn't mean you don't do radio. These guys did TV once or twice anyway. They knew social media, they know computers, they have internet magazines, but they still bothered to do radio because radio has a particular power. Remember when we're growing up in this country and we read the stories about Franklin Roosevelt and his 
chats beside the radio, the incredible power and immediacy of the word as it's transmitted through the ether from hundreds or thousands of miles away, what a powerful thing that was. Well, the FLN understood all that, and they used the weapon of radio transmission, and it created a kind of community, uh, uh, and it was remarkable uh, how successful they, they really were. So radio is something to keep in mind, because when you study a modern group, you just grab one off the shelf, the LTTE Tigers in Sri Lanka. Did they have radio? You bet they did. Most big groups have that kind of terrorism uh, breadth in their propaganda. Now, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're Catholic in our interests this evening, in the old <laughs> use of that term. We're universal enough to know that we're going to be talking about a lot of ideologies. So I just talked about nationalism, for example, which was one of the great themes <laughs> of the post-war world. Um, in this case, we have a case, another case of, of nationalism of very different type in a different place. Dating the Irish Republican Army is kind of hard. The easy one is, say, 1916 during World War I, but there's others who'd say, oh, the, the resistance to England goes way back before that. Okay, um, they've had iterations over time, and they've had a wonderful breadth in their, in their advertising and their propaganda. So long after guys like Michael Collins had left the stage, there were others who were writing, arguing, fighting for the notion of a unified Ireland. Now, we know they lost, all right, but they also made a lot of uh, marks in the world, uh, and their campaigns, both in terrorism, uh, which was sometimes selective and sometimes indiscriminate, Watch out for those who always define terrorism as indiscriminate violence. Uh, there are all kinds of assassinations groups like the IRA did that were very discriminate violence. Uh, so they did guerrilla war, they did terrorism, they did politics. They had an economic sabotage campaign that this newspaper used to track with the intense interest. Every time a big bomb would go off, the Irish people would tell you how much that just cost Britain. Remarkable very great awareness of economic warfare by these guys. So the uh, newspaper is, of course, something that uh, Irish have done for years. There were many Irish newspapers that supported militancy. This one happened to be published in New York City, and I took this for 10 years, and I studied it as much as I could, and it was really fascinating. Uh, so we have a series of uh, various uh, articles then that we could look at. I showed you 73. Uh, this is 94. Uh, here's some war news, a typical uh, section. It would have link, you know, language, a little Gaelic language, a little discussion of poetry, a book review, some history. Uh, they always had war news. And uh, they would tell you that uh, not only could they put a limpet mine on top of some sorry fellow's car, uh, but that, in fact, the results would paralyze most of London's heartland. They understood this as a war of nerves, just like Carlos Maragela said it was in 69 in his famous mini-manual of the urban guerrilla, and they weren't embarrassed about it at all. So the fact that they do sophisticated arguments should never make us think that they won't stop talking about violence, too, and the killing that they've done. And they were quite cocky about some of it, an interesting organization. Sometimes they'd hit the wrong guy, or there'd be an innocent party, and they'd publish an apology. But don't think that that's a with sort of general stepping back from the terror in the campaign. Mm -hmm. So they knew guerrilla warfare, they knew terrorism, they knew public relations, and they were good at all of it. Uh, they knew elections too. What happened to the ma the major uh, IRA chiefs of staff? You knew. They ended up later in politics, didn't they? In electoral politics. Um, Sometimes there was questions about the campaign and whether we ought to go to peace talks. Sometimes, of course, they just did this standard guerrilla thing, which is fight and talk. So it was the Armalite or the ballot box. They knew both very well. So in this case, we've got a manifest here on the right where the uh, guys that say that the cause is being sold out by all this peace talks. Maybe not too good a thing in this 1994 period. Uh, they also had commercial interests. They knew that this newspaper had to sell, and they tried to appeal to people on consumer basis, not just in terms of views. So you could buy videos. Uh, 
it isn't just sort of Al-Qaeda that invents the terrorist video. The terrorist video has been around a long time. And this one is a 1992 uh, issue. And then uh, you could even get your IRA t-shirt if you want. I've done that. I've been inside the Sinn Féin office in the heart of Dublin. And I bought myself a couple of shirts uh, that are pro-IRA. Uh, I don't wear them to office picnics. <laughs> uh, th there's one that's absolutely remarkable because IRA at one point sent three people into Colombia to help teach them how to do bombs. Uh, and uh, they were eventually caught, jailed, and released somehow in a very strange way. And nobody knows mostly what happened to those three. Uh, but these guys thought that was uh, pretty impressive. And so you could buy in the Sinn Féin office now, not the IRA provost's clandestine headquarters. In the Sinn Féin office, yeah. you could buy a shirt that links the IRA cause with these three guys who'd been in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? So they're pretty, uh, pretty uh, open. When you get to wearing you know, not just your politics on your t-shirt, but you're willing to just pledge violence and bombing and connect yourself to FARC, which is in the habit of burning whole villages with making propane bombs that are slung in an old Roman-style catapult and a lot of other tricks FARC knew already. Apparently IRA could teach him a few new things. Now I'm out in Asia now and one of the things I learned uh, in, in being here and before I went was how little interest some of us have in uh, Asian terror groups. I'd like to talk about one at least. Uh, the New People's Army, somebody I've studied for a long time. Um, at the end of the 1960s, this man revived communism in the Philippines. Um, many of you will know that there had been an earlier drive by the Balahap. There was an earlier Communist Party, too. They believe profoundly in Mao. So we get to another ideology now, about as long from nationalism as you can get, right? You ever read what international communists think about nationalism, they hate it, they're worried about it, they see is it a competitor, right? If you read somebody like Lenin or Stalin on, quote, the national problem or the nationalities problem, they're critics. People like that don't have adequate breadth, they don't see that our fight's connected to the global fight. Well, this man does. He's a follower of Mao Zedong and he thinks the great helmsman's terrific and he thinks China today is a corrupt and bourgeois and statist place that's absolutely dreadful. Uh, Jose Marie Cisson is a highly educated man. You remember where I started this talk? You remember, start thinking about how many terror group leaders are very well educated people? The head of Sendero Luminoso has two doctorates, by the way. I'm very glad that he's in jail. Uh, this guy taught English. <coughs> Uh, at Manila. Uh, he was a very good university man. And guess what? When Rodrigo Duterte was elected president in his country, the two traded notes because everybody remembered that Cison taught him when he was a professor. Mm. Isn't that interesting? That the, so, some, who, uh, some would dismiss the current president, and uh, not me, uh, as a right wing despot. Uh, well, he studied with this man. A lot of people have studied with this man. I've studied with this man. I have one of his books, I've read one of his lectures that he gave in Utrecht. I think we can study profitably with this man. He will give us a modern understanding of what Maoist arguments should be like and can be like today. And we may not think much of Mao, but if we want to understand the Naxalites in India or some of the Nepalese communists or guys in the New People's Army, we want to be willing to stop and read a little bit from someone like this. And he hasn't done too badly. In the old days of the Huck Balahap, most effort was concentrated up in Luzon, and uh, they lost as well. In this dream, the political activity is going to be nationwide, and you're going to attempt to take over all of the Philippines Republic. And those red concentrations are a map I did uh, some years ago, uh, which is still pretty valid, which shows where they've been working most, where their violent incidents are. So they do a lot of propaganda, they do a lot of attacks, and when they do a lot of covert infrastructure work, clandestine, open political effort too. And the red stuff there is a map that, that I built based on an incidents series. Uh, so it's fascinating because there's not so much color up in Luzon, and down south where we're all told there's a lot of Moros and Muslims, 
In fact, it turns out the NPA is quite strong down there. Um, the new president is from Davao City, uh, which is down here somewhere. So he fought, he had to fight the NPA in his community for a long time. And so they've been busy since the end of the 1960s. Next year, New People's Army and the, new, and the Communist Party will be at about half century. So when we think about uh, uh, the question of, say, how terror groups end or, uh, or something like that, we're aware that many of these groups run on and on for some time. So they have their little green men in the jungle, just like the Russians do, and they have their uh, propaganda efforts, too. That is, in this chapter, I'm looking especially at the human voice and the persuasiveness of it. And um, there is a lot of schooling that goes on. Um, some of my colleagues in the military have kind of uh, become uh, dismissive of NPA as a kind of criminal organization. Well, I, I don't go that way because I think they remain pretty ideological. And in fact, um, I got to interview once one of those who helped uh, work in their schools for many years. And you don't just say you're a Maoist, you've got to be one, and you've got to think and train like one and study like one. And so they do have a certain amount of propaganda and training they still go through. And uh, some of it's very uh, pedantic and book, book learning, and some of it's done orally. And in fact, some of their best orators are really, really uh, very uh, important people. Um, so when we think about terrorist communications, a way of kind of going to radio or to say, well, you know, do they publish leaflets? Yeah, they all do. But we also want to think about the human voice uh, because there are people, uh, for example, Greg Jones has a terrific book on the NPA, who's given a long description. There are people like a young woman named Tibbs who he met for that book done years ago in which uh, they have the kind of intensity and intellectual capacity to engage in a long, long uh, di diatribe or a long conversation with you or me or somebody else. And they're coaching and they're seducing and they're bringing people into that movement. Uh, and it's a very important, uh, a very important movement. Um, and they were once as big as, say, 24,000 or so, although they're far smaller now. So his legacy then is, a, and is an amazing one. This man lives in Holland, our friend Cison. He doesn't even live in the country. If he came back, I don't know what would happen. Um, he might get pardoned. He might get jailed. Uh, I don't pretend to know what Duterte would do, and because uh, he can be kind of an impetuous fellow. Uh, this fellow, though, has been everything but. All of his life, he's been on one path, and he's done a good job at it, although he's not winning and he's been losing support. He continues to propagandize and to argue. He makes music albums. Mm. He does broadcasts on all kinds of media. He writes new articles. He republishes his old stuff in new books. Uh, he's probably <laughs> writing all kinds of interesting things now. His people put out Ang Bai Yan, which is a pretty sophisticated little eight or 10 page uh, bi-weekly paper that comes out in country. Uh, he lives uh, in close quarters with a political organizer who makes sure that the fronts and open political efforts going on in the Philippines are orchestrated. In short, he's the founder of the Communist Party. He's in titular ways the head of the NPA, and he's an extremely important guy, and he hasn't given up. Uh, and after half a century, you might think he would, uh, but, he, but he hasn't. So oration is a very important thing, and uh, when we think about uh, terror groups and how they succeed or fail, uh, it's, good to, it's good to consider the good old human voice. So some terror groups have television, and that's pretty interesting. So I'm going to talk a bit about Hezbollah. Um, uh, why not, if you've got good speakers and good writers, why not put them on TV instead of confining their influence to small groups and oral delivery? Um, in fact, this is a group that's big enough and successful enough to do much, many sorts of propaganda, and, and they do. They have the full range. So after three and a half decades or so of experience, 
uh, Hezbollah is in a position where they've used terror as simply one weapon. And you remember the kidnappings in the 80s and such, and uh, other things they've done since, uh, bombing in Burgas, Bulgaria, bombings in Buenos Aires, um, and a bombing in Bangkok not long ago they were linked to. The so-called party of God is willing to use violence, and they're very willing to use politics and to publish and write. In fact, there's a new book out on them as a communications organization from Oxford, a little paperback by three authors, terrific book. We kind of finished our chapter when we found that that was out there, but it's a good piece of work done from Oxford. It's nice to see that, that uh, some others have fixed on this. And in fact, there's been an earlier book about Almanar TV, which is, which is my subject. So they do have a TV station. It's been running for a long time. Uh, Israel bombs it once in a while, and they just rebuild it, because if you're, if you're working that closely with Iran, you have almost unlimited money, and they do. They have their own streams of funds, but Iran's support uh, is generous. Uh, in this case, then, we have uh, the Beacon, as Al Minar is called, um, offering uh, one of the many sorts of things that it does. And uh, this is a kind of a cartoon setup that's aimed mostly at children. Uh, but, you know, cartoons, when they're politicized, can be powerful for adults, too. Um, it's a series of frame shots, and uh, we have uh, uh, some stone slingers on the left. We have gorillas on the top right. Uh, we have a wonderful lower right uh, silhouette of a horse, and uh, Al-Qaeda does this too. They like the white horse. Um, it's a lovely picture, actually, and the text has to do with martyrdom and such. And it's kind of interesting that it is aimed at children, uh, which uh, the UN doesn't really approve of child warriors, uh, but this group does. Uh, very much so, and uh, they go a lot. Uh, they do a lot to educate them and propagandize them, and so it's not surprising that uh, they have shows like that, as well as news shows and cultural specials and historical things and any number of other things. Now here is another case of a youth. Uh, this little girl's all fired up, and uh, she probably didn't write what she's saying, but she's saying it with real animation and passion. Uh, she says that Jerusalem is captive. Sounds interesting, doesn't it, given the local news uh, these days? Uh, she says, oh, Muslims, Palestine is calling to you. Jerusalem is calling to you. Beat the drums of jihad. And the slumber has lasted too long. All militant radical organizations are always likely to use uh, uh, the accusation that those of you who are not engaged are somehow somnolent ignoring what's important, missing the chance of history and all that. Uh, so uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, this little argument that reason is asleep and, and it can't be trusted anyway and you need activism and you need to, to follow the lead of, of uh, Hezbollah. Um, now they continue just since uh, this is not television but one of the other many things they do in propaganda is interesting here. So this is a theme, a theme park for kids and this will teach you about, uh, you know, triumphing over Israel uh, with a nice motif there of the twisted, uh, uh, you know, uh, main gun of a battle tank. Um, and since Israel has failed uh, to destroy them in war, and they've done credibly in things like uh, 06, uh, you can see why they're quite willing to, to be proud of, of it. Um, now, the television for them has uh, been a full-time thing of like print media, like radio, like diplomacy, like active political activism, you know they're, they're kind of a kingmaker in Lebanese politics, right? This is a sub-state group that's truly influential and, and powerful. Uh, they, also, uh, uh, have, uh, they also have radio. Um, when, however, other groups are brought to mind and you think about the influence, this is how I believe it, it is, probably a lot of groups would follow their model, but they don't have the resources. They don't have the money. Because running a TV station is a big enterprise. It takes a lot of technical skill. It takes a lot of money. There is an Israeli Air Force. You have other enemies. Uh, and so it's been an expensive proposition. I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I can't verify the estimates that I have. <coughs> about cost, but 
you know this has got a big budget, uh, big budget operation. Uh, so what other groups have done is in a few cases they have done TV. The Tamil Tigers had a TV station for a little while. More likely what happens is you'll pay to have spots created and uh, you get editorial control and you have, a, say, a 20-minute TV spot and you'll place that on cable. Uh, so that's, for example, what the Kurdish Workers' Party did in Europe in a couple of places, Belgian TV or Danish TV or German TV, for example. So you don't have to have a studio um, and you don't have to have a brick-and-mortar installation, but you can still get a TV presence. And that sometimes is what's doing. And by the way, if you don't have any of that, and you can't even afford to make a 20-minute TV spot, if you're a clever guy, you can get in interviews, and uh, some have. So um, in the, in the neo-fascist uh, book, The Reckoning, for example, Ingo Hasselbach describes how the neo-Nazis in Germany could often get great play on TV and in the press just by offering themselves up to do interviews. You know, turn up in the right uniform, make the usual salutes, say the right things, in which they believe, of course, and you could get yourself a pretty good interview in the German press or the foreign press. Uh, so that, too, is a technique that for those who don't have the money, uh, the others can do quite well if you uh, know how to do the interview business. Some say this book, The Call to a Global Islamic Resistance, is, uh, I've heard it called, uh, the, the most important book you've never read. Um, I actually have fought my way through all 1,600 pages, and this is an important guy. Um, he's, he's a remarkable man. <coughs> Musab al-Suri is both a terrorist and a teacher of terrorists, and his book is one I've singled out because the book is one of the great communicators of human history. Uh, one researcher said he found 106 different books written by different terrorist leaders, which is really interesting. We don't think of them taking the time. One of you was chatting with me uh, about uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri a little while ago. You know, he's done a couple books. I've only read The Knights Under the Prophet's Banner, but it's a terrific book. It's really important. And it teaches us a great deal about Al-Qaeda's thinking. He's the leader of Al-Qaeda, but, but uh, you know, we don't tend to think of terror leaders as, as that sort of, of person. But lots have written, um, and I mentioned just a few, and Al-Suri is uh, one of them. He did a book on Afghanistan, which you can get, um, and parts of his, his big book uh, are available. It was published on the web in 04 and 05. He's kind of a paradox. I can't say, I mean, he's a ghost and a paradox and a mystery man. I don't even know if he's alive, you know. Uh, but I do know he's incredibly influential. And he continues to, to influence. Um, he's a worthy successor to people like Franz Fanon, but he's more important to our day uh, because of his power of thinking and strategizing over so many Salafist groups. Uh, some have said that he's a key to ISIS thinking. There's a published article on that. I would dissuade you from that. Not only don't I think it's true, I've seen ISIS uh, propaganda that criticizes al-Suri. So be careful about that. But this is a guy he knew well. They respected each other immensely. He was never formerly, formally a part of al-Qaeda but he's key to the kind of strategy Al-Qaeda has pushed. And he learned a lot from bin Laden and, and liked what bin Laden was doing, I think. Uh, but he was his own man, and he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, well. This is a very recently published photograph. I think Peter Bergen released this, and it's of 1996. Uh, so this very important fellow uh, wrote his book, released it on the web, re-released it a few months later on the web, and it had a tremendous impact by way of re, uh, reappearing on other websites. So he did one of the oldest things. He, he wrote a book. Uh, that's been done for a long time, right? And then he released it on the web, which is one of the newest things you could do. Uh, no decor, no fancy covers, no nothing, just a text, a massive uh, text file. Uh, not unlike, say, uh, what the, uh, the, the Norwegian did uh, from the right 
about uh, his dreams for the future of Europe, uh, which he failed to fulfill by murdering a lot of children on an island in Norway. This guy's been more successful. He's been far more influential, and he's very respected. You know how that we can be sure of that? There is no, there is no one, bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, no one who's as often quoted in the Inspire magazine, of which there were 16 issues, as this guy. Large segments of his book have appeared in Inspire magazine. Uh, so he's, uh, he's important. Uh, and I thought, well, what about some other books that guys have written? Uh, this nice cover is by a woman named Bala Singham, uh, one of the top diplomats for the LTT Tigers. Uh, has passed away now. She's still alive. Uh, she wrote about the challenge of fighting Sinhalese uh, preponderance in Sri Lanka. And uh, she was with the Tamil Tigers in a very intimate way. And her specialty was coaching along the females uh, in the Tamil population, getting them to enroll, uh, getting them to fight, uh, which, uh, which, which she did. So they had entire female units. They had mixed units. They had female commandos in things like the Black Tigers. There were underwater demolitions people who were female. Uh, it's been an important part of the Tamil insurgency, which, as you know, ended in 2009, but only after three and a half decades. Uh, so Bala Singham's book was, uh, in fact, really quite uh, important. You can get this on the web. I mean, you can bring that up on your iPhone, right? And uh, this publication of 93, uh, is out there and it's a very useful thing for understanding the Tamil insurgency uh, and the problems uh, in Sri Lanka and this particular militant's effort to do something about it. Now, uh, other books uh, include this uh, manifesto. It's about the same size as Bala Singham's and this is from ISIS and it will tell you what uh, you, you, you need to know to be a good woman in the ISIS state of the future. That is, it appealed directly to you, uh, to your faith, to your politics, uh, to your femininity. It defined what the roles for you might be in the future. It urged you, if you were abroad, to come uh, to Syria and Iraq and join in the ISIS enterprise. You remember that emigration is one of the most important things that distinguishes this group. Al-Qaeda never said, we're the new caliph. Bin Laden wasn't that cocky. Or we have the new caliphate, or you need to move to Afghanistan and support the fight. Once in a while, somebody in Al-Qaeda might say that. This has been a campaign to get immigration to the ISIS state. And they told you to sort of pack your bags and move from Belgium or Morocco or wherever you were, and come and join, and then your relations uh, would be shaped there by, by your new involvement. And so that's an important book, and it's translated by the Quilliam Foundation in London. And lots of people criticize Quilliam, and I'm not too sure why. Uh, I certainly don't. I think they've done a lot to understand things like this book, which is available to you uh, on the web. Now, next section is the electronic magazine. So we continue to putter along in our chase for sort of five, seven, seven examples of, of modern media. An electronic magazine, uh, quite, a, uh, quite an impressive thing. This is the first, uh, from the first uh, issues of, the, of Inspire. Uh, it's now pretty famous because of the bomb, the, the article called uh, How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom uh, by the AQ Chef. That's not cheap, it's <coughs> Chef. And, uh, Another charmer here, this article, you see the byline, the guy's name is Terrorist. Um, there's a kind of myth in sophisticated circles like you move in and I move in that says that um, militancy's okay, guerrilla's okay, don't call me a terrorist, you know, don't sling labels like that around because it's a value-laden term that really doesn't mean anything except as an epithet. And if you're a sophisticated graduate student or a professor, you're supposed to know that. Nonsense. Nonsense. They put it right there on the cover. 
And that magazine is full of the word terrorism and boasting about how they've terrorized their enemies and quotations from the call to global Islamic resistance saying you ought to terrorize your enemies. And there's only one or two places in the Quran where that word appears, but of course they use it all the time in Inspire magazine. So think what you like about the word terror. There are terrorists like these guys who fully understand what they're doing. An older example is that fine thing, the mini-manual of the urban gorilla. Jack Tierney will remember that old book, and Mac Owens too. Uh, Carlos Maragela um, is still worth reading. In fact, I used to assign that book in my classes here. It's, a, it's another case in which terrorists speak up for terrorism and they tell you exactly what they're doing. Uh, so this is, of course, the uh, work of uh, Al-Qaeda. It's a highly sophisticated and interesting journal. There were 16 issues it's now ceased to, to publish. Uh, it had sophistication, it had rich colors, it had artwork that I actually liked. I mean, there were times when I turned the page and say, wow, that's really good. So Dabik magazine and its successor for ISIS, Rumaya, have tried to kind of do this and they're getting better, but they were never this good. Al-Qaeda was this good. They had poetry. They had snarky humor. They were so interested in being interactive and they know how you and I are. They didn't just say, this is the word from God or this is the word from Bin Laden who likes to speak. Uh, they said, uh, here's the quotation from so-and-so on CBS News. Or here's a guy down at Brookings who just talked on terrorism. Or here's a critic of Al-Qaeda in a congressional hearing expressing his anger uh, that Inspire Magazine is so pervasive. Isn't that fun? They, they poked us in the eye by printing all these kind of Western voices, many of which were critical of Al-Qaeda. So they emphasized the interactivity in that way. And by, you could always write to them. They would ask you to work with them by submitting articles or artwork. And at the back of the magazine, they had something called their public key. And they would tell you in a whole page of complicated stuff I don't understand how to communicate with them electronically in ways that the FBI can't catch you in. So this journal was a remarkable a piece of work. Uh, it should not be uh, underestimated. Nor should the crudity of uh, modern terrorism. Uh, Al-Qaeda had some discretion at some times. Uh, Al-Qaeda, for example, did not really want open war right now with Shia, even though they're all Sunni. Uh, these guys think uh, open war is just fine, uh, religious or otherwise. And uh, Dabiq magazine with the ISIS imprint uh, is not just, you know, not just in the business of running slave markets with women. Uh, they'll tell you why uh, you, th you should think it's a good idea. And that's a print from their magazine. And there's a phrase or two for you. And uh, if you think that... Um, I've maxed out now, and I can't go any further. Um, there's uh, lines in there about how much Michelle Obama might be worth in a slave market. So if you, if you think that ISIS is unbelievably arrogant about what it does, you'd be right. I cannot overstate the case. Most terrorists have shown at least some discretion ISIS never did. Maybe that's why they're losing. Now this man is the one I mentioned earlier. And uh, he's uh, uh, present, he, he was present enough uh, in, in thinking uh, among those at the Beak magazine to think that would be a good interview, and he was. And so when I saw in the Honolulu Star Advertiser part of this picture, I said, geez, I I've seen that before. That appeared after he ma this picture appeared in my paper after he massacred a bunch of people in France in November of 15. And I looked back through the stacks of Dabiq magazine on my desk, and sure enough, issue nine, here he is. So he he's uh, he was a principal. He was ready to go. He left Europe after reconnaissance. He went to Syria. He gave this interview. 
They printed him. And then he went back to Europe to commit his murders. So he says here that, uh, and uh, this is his quote, Allah chose me, etc., to travel Europe in order to terrorize the crusaders. Oop, there's that word again. To terrorize the crusaders waging war against Muslims and so forth. Uh, so it's a remarkable failure on the part of uh, law enforcement in Europe, but it's a reminder to you and me and everybody out there that we have to keep in mind the primary sources of these guys. You know, it isn't just enough for me to read the Honolulu Star Advertiser. To understand these guys, I had to read their magazine too. We need to understand the enemy, and we need to read the primary sources. Okay, so this is a different campaign. The old print advertisement. What's older than the newspaper, you know, moldering under your stairs at home? And if you're able, as the PMOI or MEKR to do satellite TV and radio interviews and uh, very good books. I've read books by this organization. Um, why would you bother with print ads? Well, they did. And there was a campaign from about 05 onward to about 2012 that I studied. It was fascinating. And it was a campaign designed to get this group, People's Mujahideen e Kalk, which means kind of holy warriors of the masses, to get them off the state terrorism list. You know Department of State keeps it, you know how short it is. Um, there's only three countries, I guess, now on there. Uh, and uh, for groups, there's only five or six dozen at any one time. And uh, MEK was founded in 65. They killed a lot of people. They ended up on the bad boys list of many countries, including America's. And uh, they wanted off. So they changed behavior in about 01, and they began focusing on politics and propaganda. We can talk more about them in discussion. The short of it is they published a long series of print advertisements which were very good. Sometimes the, the artistry might be a little shaky. Uh, here's another th example of their work. Uh, they made emotional appeals, they made political appeals, they made legal appeals. They do a black and white photo of thousands of people in a street somewhere in Brussels to show you how angry people supposedly were that they were on terrorism lists in Europe. It was a remarkably successful campaign. You look at the names on that list. They invited them to conferences, they gave papers. The Washington Post began covering this after a while. They were some, somewhat suspicious about payment terms and such. But they got a lot of people known for being conservatives or being even government people retired who used to do CT, counterterrorism. They got them involved in their activities and then they ad advertised this. International Herald Tribune today, Washington Times tomorrow, Washington Post next week. One issue of Washington Post once had two full-page ads of these guys. Can you imagine the cost in that? When I got married, I was living here, and I thought it would be nice if we had a little announcement in the Washington Post that my <laughs> wife might be charmed. So I checked out the price. <laughs> no. No, even, even a line or two would have been more than I had as a graduate student. Full-page ads. D-list us, you're doing the wrong thing. Such and such court says so. Federal judge so-and-so is complaining, he's very angry. Uh, you're murdering our children, right? So there's all kinds of interesting angles. Uh, and uh, we could talk more about the group. It was enough to say this. They conducted a full-scale print campaign, and they succeeded. And Secretary of State Clinton removed them from the list, for this and other reasons, mind you. I'm not criticizing her decision. They removed them from the state list. So in terms of, okay, what's the influence? I think that we can expect uh, groups to do things like this, especially as they work their political angles. I think in another funny way, it's almost a good lesson uh, because it isn't just the terrorists that learn. One of the things I think we've learned from the campaign they waged is that we have hard evidence that our system of listing terror groups is not unreasonable. Uh, sometimes it's argued that we are unreasonable and you, once you're on one of these you can't get off. This is a group that got itself off. They quit killing, they went full-time politics, 
they did well with it. They walked the halls of Congress right here. Wall Street Journal covered them at least two times, I remember, long feature stories about their lobbying in Congress. When I worked there, I didn't talk to them, uh, but they talked to a lot of important staffers and members, and uh, that was part of their effort. And so PMOI is off the terrorism list. Uh, so it's a remarkable thing of an old thing. I mean, if you, you know, what's, what's older than newspaper? So tonight we've seen one of the ways paper is used, and this is the way that an advertisement in paper is used. And by the way, uh, if you want to make a pitch and you have all those guys, how can you do better than putting it in the Washington Post? I think a few people would read that. And I think, moreover, that if you're in the Washington Post, you're almost legitimated just by that, right? So it isn't just a sort of Mickey Mouse local paper. Uh, it's a paper of national influence. And so even though you paid to get that in there, you are now part of the kind of post. And, and you, uh, by the way, have websites and you preserve all these. So they're not lost and worn away like paper. They're preserved. And you can go into the archives <coughs> of PMOI and you can find this kind of advertisement. So I'll quit here now and turn to questions couple of very fast conclusions. One, terrorism is very purposeful. It's very purposeful activity. It aims at psychological impact. Uh, it aims at the nervous system. It aims at the brain. It aims at the body. It aims at all those things. Second, um, ideas and arguments matter. Um, uh, it's not just, quote, propaganda. Ideas can kill. I spent a lot of time with my, within my, holding in my hands the Turner Diaries by a doctor named William Pierce writing under a pseudonym uh, and trying to understand why that uh, horrible uh, little novel about starting a race war in America was so important because my research has traced it to at least a half dozen, I think, cases, hard-known cases connected to the Turner Diaries, right? And, um, now we have other books like uh, The Call to the Global Islamic Resistance we can study. Um, these things are influential. People act based on this. People have been caught with Inspire magazine in their car, on their person, in their backpack, on the home computer in Boston after the attack on the marathon. Ideas can kill, and they do. And these groups are driven by their need for public attention and appeal to make arguments, and we need to understand those. Third and last, they've got lots of modes of communication. Um, this group had no end of money. They've got a nice big complex in the Seine Valley in France. I don't own one of those. They do. Uh, when I talk to French officials, they're very worried about the money these guys have and store and what they do with it. They could do a lot of things. What do they do? They buy newspaper ads. What an interesting thing. Uh, so they have a whole series of propaganda m methods they use, and this is one of them. And the supervening technologies, which come after something that simple, which G Gutenberg could have done, uh, are not uh, the sort of thing which causes them to cancel the old efforts. They don't quit in the old ways. They just keep that going, and they, they, they go to the new technologies, but they keep the old, too. Uh, so we have to re realize what a large repertoire uh, these guys have. And uh, it's uh, often much more sophisticated and diverse than we think. So, um, I love, uh, love Q&A, so if you happen to have any questions, I'll take them. There is a reception in the back classroom when the lecture concludes, thank you from Katie Bridges. <laughs> it's from the voice of Matt Collins. Uh, we had one here and then you'll be second. Thank you. Sir. Hello, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity to listen to you. Uh, I have a question. Actually. I was at Brown University in the summer of my high school, uh, summer, of my, or the summer of my sophomore year of high school. I took a class there um, on the Middle East. And one of the books we studied was Milestones by Said Katu, which is kind of one of the original texts about radical religion. So why do you have any thoughts about the effectiveness of Said Katu in like the modern day and his, and his thoughts when he first uh, started writing Milestones? I think it was very influential. There's uh, one of my friends who lectures a lot on the, on the origins of Islamist thought. And I know, I know you're, 
you're a sophisticated audience. I don't have to belabor the difference between Islam, which is a sub billion plus people, and Islamism. So uh, uh, we, we have the, the or, in the origins of modern Islamist activity, Saeed Qutb is incredibly important. I'm not a scholar of him, but I'm glad you've mentioned him. And he and Maududi and several others are really important. Um, and, and those um, and those in the business of terrorism, which is what I understand, what, what I study most, not, uh, not legitimate Islamic thought, but terrorism and the politics behind it, do reference him still. Not as much as you might think, um, but they do. Uh, and so uh, I, I think um, there have been enough since him now to write interesting things that maybe he won't be, you know, he won't be, he'll always be there as one of the grand old men. Uh, but he, but I don't think he'll be more influential. Bin Laden was a creative and thoughtful guy. I mean, there's a couple editions of his writings. Some of those are pretty good, really. You know, these long uh, passages about America as the new Rome and how it has to be brought low and how its power is excessive. Um, a lot of very fine, uh, long essays by Bin Laden, as well as all the video stuff. I've mentioned Knights Under the, Prop Under the Prophet's Banner uh, by, uh, by uh, Ayman al-Zawar here. Uh, that, that's a very important book. Any, any book by a current terror leader is going to be important. <coughs> there are other guys like al-Suri stepping up to the, to the game now. So you probably hear less than more about Saeed Qutb, but yes, very, very uh, influential. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, thank you so much for focusing on the communication channels. But I feel, I feel like um, you know, when a person who is um, sort of on the fence about whether they want to move from an admirer of a terrorist organization to a participant, I feel that communication itself, just listening to a message on the radio or listening to or reading a magazine, doesn't quite push them over. And I wonder if within your research you saw that whenever they communicate, it's reinforced by personal contact. Yeah. So, right, so like, you know, somebody reading a magazine is slightly swayed by this, but they contact, they reach out, and they have a person that they continue to communicate so that it's not just about the ideology, but it's also, I think that ideology is important, it's also the community they think that they're coming into. Yeah. Gee, I, I think that's terrific. I, I almost don't want to try to add to it. You're spot on. Um, there's a lot of holes in the academic work which should be filled by personal charisma. I think we've all had teachers that were revolutionary for us. I've had several. And uh, that's really important. You know, you can be much influenced by a very good voice or a very bad voice, too. Um, and uh, we have to watch it. But yes, personal contact uh, is incredibly important. You're, you're right about that. Uh, there's, there's been some, some good work on, on that uh, in the field, but not enough. And while my job tonight was to talk about ideas and the way they're placed in public and recorded for posterity and known influences of them, uh, you could do your own very good lecture based solely on the human side of how people are talked into terrorism. And by the way, there's an increasing literature on why people leave, and very often the answer is human contact. There's some terrific cases in which very smart intelligence agencies have reached somebody on the phone, and, uh, and it's the brother or it's the mother I mean, out of nowhere, and they're trying to talk you out of the underground. And sometimes a lot of things like privation and wounds that didn't do that, when supplemented by the human contact going back, you know, in one's sort of psychology back to the beginning, is very powerful. And people have quit movement sometimes based on that. Similarly, I showed you a guy in Utrecht, Netherlands, and he can write all he wants, but it's an orator named Tibbs that really recruits on the ground in the jungle, in the villages, in the Philippines. It's that song circle 
that really celebrates the 46th anniversary or 44th anniversary of the founding of the New People's Army, not that professor back in the Netherlands, you know, where he's probably living a pretty easy life, you know, and so that kind of human bond is incredibly powerful. <coughs> There's a lot of pressures on life in the clandestine life, and in fact, for psyops people and military people, as you know, that's a, there's a kind of pressure cooker environment in the underground, and so the human voice is really important. So it can be strategic communications, like a voice going over radio, or it can be the gal or the guy next to you who's talking about why we're in this fight together, or why we want to quit the fight, you know. And so the, hu the, human, the human part should never be underestimated. I'm delighted you made that comment. Yes? So I was really interested by um, the, the photo of the song circle and the way that music is used because, I mean, I think for a lot of us, we think about, you know, military songs or protest anthems, but we still use music as a teaching tool for young children all the way up to during the Ebola epidemic a couple of years ago, they were transmitting <coughs> instructions for how to avoid the epidemic via songs on the radio to people who don't have access to the internet, don't have access to television, our healthcare workers are maybe not even have any education at all. But you can teach those ideas through a medium that's accessible to everyone via the voice or via song. And I think that also the way that music touches the human brain is very different than how your brain works when you're reading or when you're listening to a speech. And so touching that other part, that deep part of you that says, I remember my grandmother singing this song when she was cooking in the kitchen, or you know, that sort of thing is really powerful. And that can be used for good or for ill. And I think it, I mean, like everything can in this sort of uh, this sort of medium. Um, I think that that's important. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about what you discovered. I, I, I learned about this only by doing this book. Uh, the research for this book, by the way, goes back to about 2010 in my chair at Marine Corps University, um, where I work now. I'm sort of too busy to do the research and all of these kinds of things, but uh, that's where I realized that. It's very late in life for me to get to that. Um, I thought I knew a lot about terrorist communication, but I missed the song. I missed the poem. I saw poems in Inspire, and I didn't see them in Dabiq. And I thought, ISIS had a lesson there they missed. And now there are poems in Dabiq. Um, and uh, songs are extremely powerful. This group has antecedents to Huck Balahap that forms in World War II to fight Japanese tyranny in their islands. And they emerge in the post-war period as a, as a communist group not Maoist or Stalinist, you know, willing to go with whatever the communist movement was internationally. It wasn't divided then. And for them, song was very powerful. I found in the Huck Balahap Constitution and in the rules for the army it, proof that you're supposed to do things like study circles and musical events. Isn't that interesting? I ignored that for years, and you obviously haven't. Uh, most groups do this. The PKK and some other groups in Europe used to do kind of events in urban settings <coughs> where they were able to attract attention and they did it with song and music. I have in my hands one of the a few pages from a terrific book about fighting in the underground by a New York Times reporter, Nicholas Gage. It's called Eleni. When Mac and I worked at the Naval War College, a very bright guy there named Al Bernstein told me I needed to read this book. One of the thousands of things in Elaney are rich descriptions which you can find about skits and music within the underground of the Greek Civil War. So you have these guys, it's in the 1940s, right? What do we think of communism in the 1940s and what its means of persuasion are? They were remarkably interested in pushing things like entertainment of little villages in the Greek highlands someplace. And the pages I have with me, I'll show them to you when you afterwards, I'll record the most amazing spontaneous effusions by people. Whereas if you'd given some speech by a professor about communism, they all would have drifted off into the night. You do a play 
which shows communists as the heroes and the local troop guys as the bad guys. And all of a sudden it's exciting and all the kids just want to come back and they want to see it. And you'll get young people going into the movement and you'll transform the whole thing. I mean, if you're a parent and all the teenagers are thrilled because the New People's Army held a dance and everything went great and the political speech wasn't that long, Next time they come to town, are you going to tell your 15-year-old he can't go? You might. You might not. It's powerful. Sir? With all the you know, propaganda, advocacy, and all these media that are used by, by terrorist groups around, around the world, how come uh, I see some countries that I'm not aware of any terrorism happening there? And maybe I don't know, you're going to correct my, my misunderstanding or ignorance on that, but there's some countries I just, I'm not aware of any terrorism there. Like, I can think of Taiwan, uh, Japan, of course, we, we would never hear, you know, and, and we would never stop hearing about that, that sarin gas attack 22 years ago. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no terrorism in Japan. Okay. Okay, and Taiwan, mm -hmm. South Korea. Yeah. So I mean, there may be a couple of a few other countries like that where they're simply not. So despite all the propaganda and all these terrorist groups, yeah. why why do I not see it? Am I missing anything? I'll add to your list. A lot of people say blandly that poverty is the cause of terrorism. That phrase appeared once in a training manual for UN workers I was reading. You know, poverty leads to extremism and discontent, and those lead to terrorism. And I don't know how the guy writing that figured that out, but I don't think it's true, because there's whole swaths of Africa, for example, where, which are not identified with any international terror group or even any significant known native domestic terror group. So there are whole parts of the world which are not infected with this. Why? You've asked a great, you've asked a great question. You need an organization to do much of this, and you need a charismatic individual, at least. You need good propagandists. In the, uh, uh, the case of the Red Army faction in Germany, another case where there's almost no Marxist-Leninist terrorism now, some anarchism, plenty of skinhead and right-wing stuff, oh yeah, but not so much Marxism anymore. That was common in the 60s. In the, in the RAF, it was a troika. Andreas Bader, who was a kind of arrogant and uh, uh, self-possessed uh, uh, cocky male, two women, Gudrun Enslin and Ulrike Meinhof. Meinhof was one of the brains of that outfit. She's a former journalist. She made her mark in that before she joined the group. Uh, and uh, she was very bright and did a lot of the writing. Gudrun Eslin, who's never remembered, was both the girlfriend of Bader, but the local kind of ideologist. You know, he thought about how fast the car would be when they did the getaway. And that was about the limits to his thinking. She was smart. And Ulrike Meinhof was smart. And Meinhof wasn't much liked by Enslin, and she was abused by Bader in some ways. But it took that troika. So it isn't just to know that there could be a radio or there could be a leaflet. You have to have somebody pushing it. And RAF, although small, had a propaganda organization, partly because they had a journalist working for them. And you can run this show individually. You know the story of Theodore Kaczynski? He's an American echo terrorist. There are more of those out there than you might think. Here's a fun, they, they're mostly that movement crested, but um, there are still some groups willing to go that far in the ecology movement. This is kind of fun. That was one of the early posters for guys who said, look, the ecology, ecology in America is so important, we're, we're not just going to complain, we're going to fight for it. And there was a series of militant organizations. One of the most interesting men was another PhD, Theodore Kaczynski, mathematics expert, loner, oddball. Uh, he conducted a 17-year campaign or something like that of bombings. Well, he did a 35,000-word manifesto on a typewriter in his cabin in Montana. There's a guy who didn't, for whom it wasn't enough just to kill or maim. Many of his bombs were aimed at maiming. He was a guy who really wanted to sell you his ideas. And he said, by the way, 
there's a lot of ideas out there, but darn it, you know, you can just get lost. There's too many ideas. If you want to look at mine, I'm going to make you look at mine. To do that, I'm sorry, but I've had to kill. I've had to kill. It isn't enough just to raise your voice and to be right. And Ted always knew he was right. You have to kill to get your voice transmitted. So it's that wedding of action and violence. So there are cases like that where in, my book ends, actually, this one, which uh, is going to be outside there. It ends with a couple cases of well, uh, one guy named Miller who's a neo-fascist. There are individuals who write and publish like crazy. You know, and not just act or strike with a knife or something, but actually are their own propagandists. But most of the people I've studied tonight with you are part of larger groups and they have resources and they have depth and they have bench strength. So when Samir Khan, an American who joins Al Qaeda, uh, was uh, telling a story in one of the magazines I have here, and somebody wants to see it, it's a marvelous article The Media Conflict. He tells the story of being in a whole room full of clattering typewriters and computers with all kinds of work getting done. And a commander comes in from outside and sees it all and says, this is really good because the word and the argument are half of the jihad. And he recognized that quotation as being from bin Laden. And he knew that bin Laden invested a lot in media too, right? So they're all proud of their enterprise. So normally it's a bigger enterprise. But even an individual can strike out on his own. So that sounds like a long answer, but I think I made a couple points. The propaganda is, can be done by governments, by individuals, by regional organizations, by anybody. But you have to have the drive, the focus, and take the line and decide how you want to do that. <coughs> Very few terror groups do without propaganda. There are always at least a leaflet left at the scene or a telephone call for a claim because otherwise nobody knows what that is. Nobody knows why that happened. There's no payoff politically, right? But whether you do a book or just a phone call is up to you.